okay, let's start um, with this uh, ENLA seminar um, today. If you're joining us for the first time, so I've got a couple of uh, housekeeping announcement, announcements. Um, there will be, we allow questions either in the chat uh, of the Zoom or in the Q&A of the Zoom, which you can use. Uh, you're welcome to use this during the talk. Um, Valeria will be handling uh, the questions uh, from Zoom. And if you're joining us on YouTube, you're also welcome to ask questions during the talk. Um, and uh, we will answer them either during the talk or after the talk. Uh, so let's introduce today's speaker, uh, who doesn't actually need any introduction, uh, Cleve Moller, uh, who is basically known as the inventor of MATLAB. Uh, let me give you a couple of details. Cleve did his PhD uh, at the University of Stanford under George Forsythe, uh, then went on uh, to work at a couple of universities, namely the University of Michigan, University of Stanford University, and uh, the University of New Mexico. And during his time at the universities, he was also one of the authors of uh, LINPAC and ICEPAC, um, well-known Fortran libraries, and uh, basically in order to make the life of his students at uh, New Mexico easier, he, he, in, he invented MATLAB to give his students an easy access to, to these Fortran routines. Um, and after uh, a while, he founded MathWorks with uh, Jack Little and, and the rest is history. Um, he has won many awards. Uh, he has uh, uh, honorary doctorates from many universities. I'm not going to list them all. Uh, one couple of other things I'd like to mention is he's been, uh, he's been, he's received the Computer Pioneer Award, the IEEE John von Neumann Medal. Uh, he's been SIAM president uh, amongst other uh, awards. And uh, we are happy to have him here at this uh, ENLA seminar. Um, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Melina. You've already given the first third of my talk. Um, so I, the thing I like to say is I am the world's first MATLAB programmer. Um, I'll explain this title in a little while. I'm going to start with this a picture, which you've all seen. This is the organizing committee for the 1964 the conference in Gatlinburg on uh, Numerical algebra that has become the that were the Gatlinburg conferences and then the Householder conferences. Uh, many of us were scheduled to go to Italy in two and a half weeks for uh, Householder Twenty One, and this seminar is a, a direct effect of the fact that uh, we're not going to be able to go there, at least for a year. All six of these men had uh, important influences on. MATLAB, Wilkinson for matrix computation, Gibbons transformations, Forsyth for teaching me that software was a means of, for people to communicate with each other, not just programming computers, householder transformations. Uh, Peter Enrizzi was a friend of Forsyth from UCLA. He made contributions to the MathWorks logo. And um, uh, Fritz Bauer, was one of the primary architects of the Algol programming language. And you can see that uh, MathWorks is an uh, offshoot of that. And speaking of the logo, here's a page out of my PhD thesis. These numbers took a half an hour to compute on Stanford's mainframe at the time. I should have the eigenvalues of domains like this. I could only draw a two-dimensional contour plot uh, with a CalComp plotter. Uh, MathWorks has taken that, turned it into a three, uh, black and white wireframe, and then various lighting models that becomes our logo today. As far as I know, we're the only company in the world with the solution to a partial differential equation as our company logo. Forsyth thought uh, uh, the numerical analysis course in 1964 uh, I taught it as a new instructor in the new computer science department in 1965. And the notes for that course became this book. Uh, the book has four, has software in it. It has Fortran, it has programs in Fortran 
an algal and a language called PL1. Can you remember that? Uh, for solving systems with linear equations. That eventually became MATLAB's backslash operator. Meanwhile, Wilkinson and his colleagues were working on uh, algorithms for computing matrix eigenvalues. They were collected in this book. Uh, notice that uh, Bauer and Householder were also involved in this series of books. Uh, and and um, Wilkinson visited the United States every summer. Uh, as a short course at the University of Michigan. And then he went to Argonne Laboratory outside of Chicago, where we were in the process of taking the algol and turning it into Fortran so uh, people could use it. Uh, that became the ice pack project for Eigen System Package. These people were all at Argonne and I visited Argonne in the summers. That was followed by the Linpack project to produce software for linear equations. Uh, this was not a translation of anybody else's alcohol. This was uh, started from scratch. Um, here are the authors of Linpack in 1979. Uh, Jack Tengara was just a kid back then. Here's me in my sandals. Here's Pete Stewart and Jim Bunch. And Jack's car has a Lindback license plate. Here we are 33 years later. Uh, Jack's lost the most hair, but I have the nicest shirt. Lindback is known today as a benchmark more than a collection of software. And that's because of this page, uh, an appendix in the Lindback user's guide We'd ask a number of universities and laboratories to time our routines and Jack computed the megaflop rate. Millions of floating point operations. The fastest computer in the world then was the newly installed Cray at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And it was doing 14 megaflops, 14 million floating point operations. This is on a 100 by 100 linear system because that's all the memory these machines had. In fact, the machine at Yale didn't even have enough memory to do a 100 by 100 system. So it did a 75 by 75 and we extrapolated. The Linpet benchmark is now called the top 500. That's how you decide the fastest. That's the order to the fastest computers in the world. They're still solving those systems linear equations by Gaussian elimination. System is a little bit bigger than 100 by 100, but it's still, uh, doing backslash. Um, I wanted this, Melinda said, I wanted to have my students be able to use Linpack and Icepack without writing Fortran programs and to use it interactively rather than go through the, the batch uh, compile uh, load that was required with Fortran and, and C. So I read this book uh, by Klaus Wirth this was worth, worth it invented Pascal as his reaction to algol. And then this book talked about a language called PL0. That was his snipe at PL1. And uh, this book, I learned how to parse programming languages from this book. The first MATLAB was PL0 written in Fortran with matrix as the only data type. Here's the uh, startup screen. This is all the functions that there, there were in, the, in that program, that first MATLAB. It wasn't a programming language. There weren't any M files. There's no ODEs, there's no FFTs. There's, um, if you wanted to add something to the system, you have to get the source for MATLAB from me, which I was glad to give you, uh, write a program in Fortran, and, and recompile MATLAB. Uh, here's something that did work in MATLAB at the time. Uh, this matrix, if you change this plus sign to a, change this to a plus sign, and get rid of the two is the Hilbert matrix. I wanted to have a non-symmetric Hilbert matrix. And I was amazed to find the singular values were equal to pi. And it was some time before Seymour Parter explained why that happened. 
this was kind of a joke. Uh, this was portable machine independent graphics at the time. This was the plot command, uh, but it was an indicator of what was what to come in MATLAB where graphics is such an important part. Um, so that's the, uh, the, first, the first part uh, about the early history of MATLAB and I'll pause now to see if there's anybody got any questions about that. Uh, I don't see any question from here. Okay. So we can just proceed, I think. All right. I uh, went to Stanford in 1979 on a sabbatical. Uh, I taught the graduate numerical analysis class, and I used that matrix calculator uh, in the class. The math and computer science students were not impressed at the time. This was not sophisticated numerical analysis. It was not sophisticated computer science. But about a dozen engineers, engineering students took the class and they loved MATLAB. They were doing things I didn't know anything about at the time, control theory and signal processing systems theory and matrices were the language of those, of those subjects. Uh, so they immediately adopted Fortran, ad adopted MATLAB. Uh, Jack Little had gone to Stanford and was working in, as a control engineer near, nearby. Uh, he didn't take my class, but a friend of his did and uh, showed him MATLAB. And Jack immediately took, uh, threw away his Fortran and started using MATLAB for his consulting work. A couple of years later, he came to me and he said he wanted to make a company out of MATLAB. Uh, commercialized the software. He went down to Sears and bought this compact uh, portable uh, for, uh, for his own money. Uh, it didn't even have any hard drives. Had to swap floppy disks in and out. Uh, he he uh, re-implemented MATLAB in C. A friend of his named Steve Bangert worked with him on the weekends. And the three of us founded MathWorks in California in 1984. And the first MathWorks MATLAB made its debut at the Controls Conference in Las Vegas just before Christmas in 1984. Uh, Jack Little was the only employee of MathWorks in 1984. Banger joined him in 1985, doubling the size of the company to two people. And that growth of doubling every year kept up for seven years. Uh, we haven't grown at that rate uh, anymore. Here's a log plot of the size of the MathWorks, the head count of MathWorks over the last 35 years. The slope here is one, means we double every year for the first seven years. The slope means we now double about once every five years. Here was MathWorks when it had only eight people. Uh, here's, uh, here's Jack. Um, I didn't work for the company for the first five years. I was off doing other things in Silicon Valley, but I joined MathWorks in 1989. Uh, here, here I am over here. Here's Jack up here. Uh, this is when we had about uh, Two to the fifth people. Uh, the company continued to grow. Uh, by 2005, we were an international company with a dozen offices around the world. So a company picture uh, required uh, snapshots from them. Uh, here's Lauren Shure. Um, the, the, what the Red Sox had just won the World Series. Uh, here, here is the, uh, our 35th anniversary a year ago. Uh, and this is part of the company uh, as it was a year ago. Here I am right here. So MathWorks is an international company with offices all over the world, development going on. Our, our main office is in, is in Natick, Massachusetts. There are offices in England Germany, India, Australia. There's development going on in, in Germany, uh, in, in England, 
uh, as India, uh, as well as in the United States. Here's some statistics about uh, MathWorks today. Uh, in, in last year, we made over a billion dollars in revenue or turnover, as the Brits like to say. We have over 5,000 employees uh, all around the world. Um, we have millions of users. This statistic, uh, I was amazed when I first saw it, a half a million visits per day to the uh, MathWorks website. That's incredible. Here's our company, the newly remodeled uh, company headquarters in Natick. Here's a party, a barbecue uh, on, the, on the lawn outside the Natick offices. Uh, MathWorks is about its people. And uh, this uh, the shot like this reminds me of the importance of the people that are working at the company. We recently opened a second office a couple miles uh, west of the first office. This is called the Lakeside Campus. So this Lake Kachichuit and their beautiful architecture on these uh, buildings in the new campus. Uh, this will remind me, MATLAB isn't, isn't, the matrix, isn't the matrix laboratory anymore. We're in all these businesses, uh, automated driving, control, uh, image processing, uh, hearing aids, uh, biomathematics. Uh, that's emphasized by our toolboxes. These are libraries of MATLAB programs that extend its capability in various specialized areas. And there are over six, over 60 toolboxes today. Uh, and this gives you an idea of, of the businesses we're in. And then there's Simulink, which is our companion uh, system, which runs on top of MATLAB. And it has a whole other uh, group of special, specialty tool, uh, block sets. I just want to mention one, one example of the work that goes on around the world in MATLAB. And that's, this is off of our web page and it shows the uh, recent uh, work that's been done on the virus uh, by scientists around the world using MATLAB. There are a number of papers on this page, a very important paper in, in nature. Uh, and I'll, I, here was a paper out of South Korea that I want to talk about. And uh, here's just some more of the papers that have been written that uh, use MATLAB and, and acknowledge the use of MATLAB in the paper. Uh, and the list goes on. Uh, on and on, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, then there's the work that's done on ventilators, uh, a completely different type of work from modeling the disease. Uh, here's MATLAB uh, at its best in, in control of these machines. Uh, some of the papers that have been written about, written by, uh, about ventilators. I want to talk about this uh, paper that was uh, from South Korea. Uh, here's one of the authors on South Korean national television. Uh, there's a MATLAB plot behind, oops, MATLAB plot behind her. Uh, I skipped to the next slide. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, here's her model, a compartmental model about uh, the, called a SEIR model. Uh, and uh, she made the news because she'd done a good job of describing what was happening to South Korea today, but she was predicting that the, there was gonna be a resurgence in October and that got her on national television. I, I bring her up because, uh, because of this picture. Uh, one of her colleagues is in the audience here. Uh, and this is me 
talking in, in South Korea in 2006. And if you look at the title of my talk, it's the evolution of MATLAB. Let's zoom in on that title. And when I saw this, I said, decided this was, two, this was 2006. After 14 years, it was time to change the title of my talk. And so that's why we have uh, the evolution of, the, of this talk. Uh, let's see if we got any questions about, uh, about MathWorks and its, its history. So uh, I don't see any, uh, any question. Uh, I do have a question. So um, about uh, the latest, latest issues, do they uh, work with you, uh, for instance, with this research on COVID or just uh, they, uh, they contact you to show how good MATLAB is? Uh, work with you as um, uh, work with math, MathWorks, or it just uh, no. They shows. don't. They don't. They don't work with MathWorks. I don't think there's anybody at MathWorks working on working on COVID. Uh, we provide the tools for scientists to to do that work. We have people at MathWorks who who could do that kind of work, but that that's not their their main activity. I'll talk in a minute about some cooperative activity. But not not so, not on, not so much on COVID. Uh, okay, so there are other questions. Um, so on the first photo you showed about MathWorks, the um, people that work there. How many are still MathWorks? Lauren, others. This was by Tim Davis. This question. Uh, uh, hi, Tim. Um, a lot of those pictures, of, a lot of the people in those original pictures are still here. There are people now that have worked for MathWorks for 25, coming on 30 years. Uh, so uh, yes, they're all there. Are many of them are, are still there. So the initial group of here. eight. What about the initial group of eight? Uh, half of them, I think. Uh, Jim Tung, um, Jack, and Lauren. Maybe three out of the eight are still there. Okay. Good sign. It's a good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I really okay. rushed. I really rushed through that because I want to leave some time to talk about uh, two projects that I'm involved in now. Neither one of them are complete, uh, but I'll give you a progress report. This is about animal, wild animal camera traps uh, with um, Jim Sanderson was my PhD student in math at the University of New Mexico. He wrote a PhD in numerical linear algebra. Uh, but then he worked at Los Alamos for a while, but then he had a midlife crisis, went back to graduate school and became an ecologist. He's now the world's leading authority on small wild cats. And uh, jo Joanna and Heather, are two experts in machine learning that are math words that have been working on this project. Uh, we have data from camera from cameras that are on the at watering holes uh, in uh, five in five sites. Uh, most of the data comes from a place called uh, uh, Sevieta on the Rio Grande Valley in the middle of New Mexico. There are two uh, sites uh, near the border of Mexico and Arizona. Uh, this one in Southern New Mexico is a private ranch owned by Ted Turner, who's famous for starting CNN and marrying Jane Fonda. And then there's a site uh, down near the Mexican border uh, in, in, near Brownsville, Texas. But uh, as I said, there's over four and a half million images, uh, two terabytes of data uh, of, these, of these JPEGs from 50, more than almost 100 cameras at these sites. Two thirds of the images have been classified by experts. So we know what, the, what animals are seeing there. But two, uh, two of the sites, uh, including Turner's Ranch, 
uh, this data hasn't been classified. Um, so we're going to use uh, machine learning to uh, to try and identify the animals. Some some of the images are real portraits of the animals. Here's a mother mother bear and her two cubs taking a bath in the watering hole. Here's a coyote. There's a golden eagle about to take off. And here's uh, the roadrunner uh, made famous by the cartoons. Now, some of the images are more problematic. Some of them are, many of them are taken at night with an infrared uh, and you just get, a, you just get a grayscale images. Here's mule deer, here's a wild cat of some kind. Now these two images, are both of the same animal. This is an oryx, a kind of African antelope. Traditional image processing would try to count the number of legs, identify the long antlers, the no tail. But then when you have this picture of the oryx, none of that is apparent. And the experts have told us that both of these pictures are of oryx. So the machine learner uh, the artificial intelligence just sees a new picture, decides it looks more like an oryx than it looks like these, and so it must be an oryx. It doesn't try to understand what it's really looking at. Then there are pictures like these. There are humans in the pictures, ranchers, rangers, hikers. They call these things ghosts. They're just wisps of some kind that set off the camera trap. My father would have called, this is a bear. Now, my father would have called this the south end of a bear going north. Uh, the reason we know it's a bear is because it's in a burst of images of, of a bear around the camera. You certainly can't tell it's a bear from the, uh, uh, the one shot. Now we have not yet taken advantage of the time sequence of the images. Uh, that would have uh, uh, begun to be like image processing like we do with the automated driving. But it's a question of not frames per second, but seconds per frame, because there's maybe five or 10 seconds between each picture, picture out of these cameras. Then there's situations like this uh, with the lighting, uh, can you figure out what animal is in that picture? I can't. Uh, so you probably haven't heard of the javelina. This is uh, one of my favorite animals. We had a family of javelina living in our ranch in, in Arizona. And uh, they're, they're called wild pigs. But they're not really pigs, they're a different species. They're really ugly, but baby javelina, and here's one in this picture, uh, are really cute. Uh, the vast majority of the, well, not the vast majority, a quarter of the images, over a million of the images, are of mule deer. So mule deer completely dominates uh, the pictures, the pictures we have that have been identified. Uh, pronghorn antelope and elk are prevalent. And then this, uh, there are less than a thousand images of uh, falcons, and kit fox, and squirrel. Uh, so orders of magnitude difference in, in the uh, number of images we have of these species. Uh, the classification is done by, so MathWorks has been in the, this business for a long time used to be called neural nets. Uh, now it's called uh, artificial intelligence, image recognition. There's a uh, image recognition neural net called the Inception V3 uh, uh, that uh, a number of people who contribute to, to, to its development. And there's a, a collection of images on the net called ImageNet. And so we're using the Inception V3 neural net trained on uh, images from ImageNet. 
Uh, this is Sanderson's file structure for the images on tape. Here's the cameras, the species, the numbers, and finally you get down to the images. This is a way that it's convenient for the experts to classify them. It's not so convenient to parse in the, in the, in the programming. Uh, Heather said she kept getting distracted by uh, pictures of cute animals. That what made uh, made the project. It was a difficult, a challenge in the project. Uh, here is one of the first tests we did. This is bear versus no bear. There's only two categories. Either the picture is a bear or it's not a picture of a bear. And the system can do really well uh, at, uh, at, at this uh, simple recognition. For a little bit more uh, sophisticated uh, try, we divided the species into 10 groups. Oh, oh, this is before that. Here's pictures of bear versus no bear. So this is a bear. This old tire is not a bear and so on. Except this, it was classified as not a bear, even though it is. Anyway, more than bear versus no bear, we went to 10 categories. Bear is still one of the categories. Uh, Havelina is one of the categories. Roadrunner is the categories. But then the other categories include many different kinds of animals. Uh, domestic animals, uh, people, uh, and then just everything that's left over is divided into large and small. Uh, now, here's the results of uh, on that grouping. You take 70% of the data and uh, train the uh, learner on 70%, and then you take 30% of the data and see how it does it at, check, at uh, classifying that. And these are the results. Uh, this wouldn't be, this wouldn't impress anybody in the machine learning business, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it, it might well be useful to the experts in this business in helping them to decide uh, which images to look at, if nothing else. Uh, and we have uh, lots of these kinds of pictures. Uh, the system is very good at picking out bears. Uh, it's very good at picking out domestic animals, like here's some cows. It's not so good on the Roadrunner. Uh, trying to distinguish a Roadrunner picture from uh, other kinds of birds, it's, it's not very good at. Uh, just a couple of days ago, we ran uh, the learner on the data set from um, Turner's Ranch. And here's what we found. Everything's a large animal. There's so many of them that we get the large category predicted very frequently. It can, it's, it's pretty good at Im images that don't have anything in them uh, and, uh, and also predict uh, uh, some kinds of human activity. But as to finer distinction on the animals, uh, not much luck there so far. We're gonna continue to work on this. Okay, here's the last, here's another project that I'm involved in about self-synchronizing oscillators uh, with Indica uh, Rajapaski at, at University of Michigan. He's a mathematical biologist and is interested in cell biology. And Steve Smale at uh, Berkeley is a world renowned expert in dy dynamic systems. Indica and Steve, I've already written papers about this. This is a human heart cell. This is a one cell in the human heart isolated in a Petri dish. Uh, this thing is, is, is pulsing. It's pulsing at what, its own rate. Uh, when it's gonna be, if it's gonna become part of a heart, 
it has to synchronize with other heart, uh, heart cells. How does that happen? How do the heart cells all synchronize and bump at the same at the same time? I'm going to use this example. And it, you know, it's hard to think of this as an oscillator, but these runners are synchronized. They're running together in a pack. Uh, they're not all, they're not exactly synchronized. This one is ahead, this one is behind. This is called phase lock when they travel uh, like this. If you view it from above, it's an oscillator because they're going around and around uh, this track. So that's the oscillation uh, of these runners. So theta is the distance that's run and e to the i theta is on the unit circle. Uh, that's the oscillator part. The Kuramoto equations 1975, a Japanese physicist uh, first proposed this model. And he, he, there's an interview with him on YouTube when he talks about how amazed he is uh, at where uh, this has been applied. The model, the model doesn't explain why uh, the synchronization happens. It just mimics uh, the synchronization. Uh, so theta dot is omega. That's the linear part. If that were the only part, each theta would be going on its own speed, omega. But then this sum couples everyone to everyone else. Um, the fast thetas, these are, this, is, this, this sum is negative and that slows them down. The slow thetas, this sum is positive and it speeds them up. And the strength of this synchronization is measured by this parameter kappa, which is an essential part of the model. Um, we're going to look at it from the point of view of this potential, uh, a sum of squares that uh, measures how far things are from synchronization. And when this, with, with, when this potential is equal to one, when it's equal to its maximum, they are the most unsynchronized they can be. If they were all equal, if all the thetas were equal, if they were perfectly synchronized, the potential would be zero. The gradient of that potential, that is the partial derivatives with respect to theta, is the same as the driving term in, in Koromoto's original equation. So he didn't express it in terms of this potential. So from our point of view, this is the differential equations. Um, this is the differential equations. Theta dot is omega. That's the linear part. And then uh, the gradient of theta uh, is the synchronizing part with a, again, this coefficient kappa. These omegas are called the natural frequencies of the uh, oscillators. Uh, here's, uh, let's see, there, there, I have to talk about this first. The initial conditions are that things are completely unsynchronized, as unsynchronized as they can be. This is starting the runners staggered uh, around the racetrack. Uh, so they're as unsynchronized as they can be. Uh, and this formula involves pi. You think you think pi is a constant, but in our model, it's actually a, a parameter, and it can be varied slightly. It's very sensitive to the value of pi, and so we have this kind of slider that I call a pi bar that I talked about in a recent blog that just uh, chops digits off of pi uh, in that formula. Uh, if uh, pi is less than the traditional pi, the oscillators are moved towards the origin. Uh, these ones are, the fast ones are slowed down, the slow ones are sped up. If pi is equal to the traditional pi, they're equally spaced. If pi is a little bit bigger than the traditional pi, the fast ones are forced away from the origin, they go even faster, and the slow ones get slowed down. But it's very sensitive to this value of pi. 
And the omegas are important. Uh, the omegas in this, in, in our case, we're having the omegas equally spaced with the spacing sigma. So this sigma and the kappa are the two dominant per parameters. Uh, kappa is the strength of the synchronization and sigma is the strength of the uh, uh, linear part. Uh, the coordinate system actually rotates uh, with the runners. You think of measuring time uh, in the in the center of the center of the group of synchronized uh, runners. Uh, here's here's what happens. Here's here's synchronization. These stages are starting out uh, around the unit circle. Slow the fast ones get slower. The slow ones get faster and they get synchronized. Now, when we publish a paper, we can't have that on animation. So we have this kind of graphic that summarizes everything. Here's the graph of the thetas, and here's the graph, this is snapshots out of the, out of the animation. You can, see the, you can see the oscillators here coming together uh, at a com common speed. Here's a kind that's going in the opposite direction. These guys, the fast ones are going to speed up. The slow ones are going to get even slower. And you're going to get a, uh, a partial synchronization. This one in the middle is left out, can't decide which way to go. And so this is an unstable, this is a, a saddle in the dynamics. And it's an unstable critical point. If we perturb this one a little bit, it'll go join the others. Uh, and here's a graph of, of uh, the behavior of the thetas in that situation. A snapshots out of the movie, shows what happens to the gradient. In this case, the omegas are all equal to zero. Uh, now here's a uh, complete, uh, here's, here's no synchronization. These thetas are just uh, going around at their own speed. The uh, potential never never settles, settles down. Uh, the fast state is gets going faster. Slow ones get going slower. You get beautiful graphs of the gradient, uh, but you don't get any synchronization. So this is the model of the curl model model of the world. Half of the here's half is uh, unstable if sigma is too big. Uh, it'll be unstable. If sigma is smaller, it'll be stable. The, the potential will approach a limit. And this dividing line between stable and stability and instability is called critical coupling. The really interesting action, uh, which we're all interested in here is down here. When sigma is equal to zero, that is when there's no linear term it's all governed by the, uh, by the nonlinear gradient. Uh, you get uh, these complicated dynamics uh, uh, of this type. So here, is, here are th three oscillators. Uh, and uh, if we uh, perturb them a little bit, increase them, they get separation and behave like this. And then they go to a point where it reach where it reaches theta reaches a constant uh, and it stays there, but the but the uh, potential hasn't gone to zero. This is a, a saddle point. It's an unstable uh, critical point, and you perturb it from that, uh, and it. it uh, it becomes stable. There's the same behavior with four oscillators. And then with five oscillators. So this is what we're studying is these uh, the behavior and the dynamics uh, at this near equilibrium. I have okay. a couple of questions about this application, and then we go yeah. back to the previous one, maybe. Okay. Uh, the first question is, uh, 
uh, when you mix physics and psychology, do you get game theory? The question is from Piotr Luszczyk. Uh, yeah, I uh, uh, game theory. I I don't. I haven't seen that in here. Uh, I don't know. That's not part of what we're looking at. Okay. So the other question is. Why do this from the very beginning of the application? Why do runners synchronize physics, psychology, maybe both? Sure, the the uh, the fluid dynamics of running in a group uh, is very favorable to the running. The psychology of running together uh, is favorable. So that that's why they synchronize the Kuramoto equations. Don't have any of that. There's no physics, no psychology in the Kuramoto equations. As I said, they just mimic the, sir, the uh, synchronization. They don't explain it. Okay, so may I continue with some other questions? Or you sure. prefer to, sure. okay, sure. I'm, I, uh, so I'm, just, I'm just about to, gonna, uh, let, me, let me finish up. Okay, good, 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 good. So, MATLAB's historical and intellectual basis is numerical linear algebra, but it derives its commercial success today from all the applications in a wide variety of technical fields. Uh, it's a complicated program with millions of lines of code. We're back to Fortran for the... Uh, um, ah. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm gonna quit here. I, I, yeah, I got the to plug that in someplace. It came unplugged. Um, and uh, uh, there, that ought to work. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I love this quote from Jim McClellan at Georgia Tech. The reason why Matt Lab is so good at something is because it wasn't designed for that something. It was designed to do mathematics. And uh, that's the uh, end of the formal presentation. And I'll be glad to take any more questions. Yes, there are a few more actually. Um, so uh, since there is a connection between the different uh, questions, I start from the older ones. So there are two questions on uh, uh, competitors. So the first one is, uh, can you comment about the future of MATLAB in context of mathematical research among other options emerging out like Julia or Python or others? The other question by Dan Bali is, does MathWorks see competition from crowdsourced software in R and Python popular among statisticians and machine learning forks? Sure. Uh, that's competition. It's important competition. Uh, I don't want to get involved in uh, language wars. Um, math, MathWorks is, is in so many different fields. Mathematics, the Julia world, mathematic world is a small part of the business. They don't, Julia and, Matt, and uh, mathematics don't have any impact on, on the automobile industry or the hearing aid industry, or the whole world of Simulink. Uh, and the same is true of the, uh, of, of the open stores. Uh, so Matt, Matt Labs has competitors in many different fields, uh, but there's no competitor that's in all the fields we're in. Okay. So uh, two related questions are, so on one, one hand, and this is my question though, <laughs> on one hand, I see from the, uh, your first application that you uh, use for deep learning that it looks more like a black box package other than a computational development environment. So uh, is this direction MATLAB is taking or we can still put our hands in? Well, that's a wonderful question. And machine learning, I'm afraid it's, it is a black box. I don't know anybody who can explain why machine learning is as good at it as it is. Gil Strang has written a book on, on machine learning that many of us in, in, in this group would enjoy reading. 
but I'm afraid he doesn't really say why it works. He'll say he'll say it's it, it's a it's a mystery. I wish we had a better mathematical understanding of why machine learning is so successful. Okay, related question: How suitable is MATLAB for running simulations that run for days? To what percentage, on average, would it match an equivalent efficient C++ implementation? Do you want me to read again the question? Yeah, I'll try it again. Very long one. How suitable is MATLAB for running simulations that run for days? And uh, to what percentage would it match an equivalent efficient C++ implementation? Why should they choose MATLAB instead of a C++ implementation? Well, because math works, because MATLAB is easy, easier to use. Matt this was Labs, from an anonymous so, attendee, so he doesn't want to show up, he or she. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can, I can write a program in any language that will run for days. Um, these, these machine, this machine learning, uh, it takes a long time for it to, it to classify things. Uh, and uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you program is MATLAB program is using stuff that's in the libraries, like it was doing numerical linear algebra or solving ordinary differential equations, it'll be as fast as anything you can write in, in C or C++, probably faster because those li libraries are highly optimized. Uh, if, if you write a, uh, an inefficient program in MATLAB, it'll be inefficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we're getting better at uh, making MATLAB run faster. Uh, that's an important effort for us. Uh, that, that's, that's, what, that's part of the answer. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Stefan, do you have further questions from uh, YouTube? Uh, yes, we have two questions which are related uh, by Martin Stoll and Peter Benner. Um, what would be your vision for MATLAB R2030A? And also, what are the main challenges for MathWorks in the future? Um, I, I'm, I'm not very good at predicting the future. Um, MathWorks has choose challenges in the fields it's in today. We have people working on all these different toolboxes on all these different block sets, and they have plenty of work to keep them busy improving those things uh, for the next several years. And we'll make sl slow progress in the fields we're already in. Uh, we'll take on new challenges. We've barely touched uh, medicine, biomathematics, uh, and uh, so we'll just uh, keep on doing what we're doing. Uh, and uh, MathWorks will get more powerful and, and faster. And may I just add another question by myself? When are we getting new Easter eggs in MATLAB? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the, the, uh, so you, you old timers know that uh, there have been some uh, things in MATLAB including the original MATLAB called Easter eggs that uh, uh, hidden, hidden features. The trouble with those is, is the testing. So we do very rigorous testing. And how do you test something that uh, is supposed to be invisible? So it's, it's, uh, it's not a good idea to have surprises uh, in, uh, in, in high quality software. So that's what's happened to the Easter eggs of the past. Uh, in the stuff I write, so there's something called Cleves Lab, which are just a collection of, of uh, MATLAB codes that I've written for my own enjoyment and, and, and for the blog. There, there's not so much rigorous testing. And there are some Easter eggs hidden in, in Cleve's lab. So if you, if you want to get some surprises, 
uh, download uh, Cleve's laboratory and try some of the uh, some of the experiments that are there. Okay, we'll certainly do this, Cleve. Uh, one more question from Peter O'Regan. Um, he's wondering um, if you might comment on what was the most fun or enlightening project you have you were able to work on with MATLAB. The ever. thing I enjoy about MATLAB is learning about all these new things. Uh, machine learning, uh, biomedicine, uh, control theory, uh, automated driving. Um, I, I'm, I'm learning something every day. And uh, th that's, what, that's, what I, that's what I love about MATLAB. Um, I, I, I have a wonderful job just uh, tinker, tinkering with MATLAB and uh, that's what's enjoyable. And getting to talk to it, talk about it uh, like I have been at this seminar. So uh, thanks everybody for uh, coming out and uh, hearing about the evolution, about uh, why I changed my title slightly. Uh, over 16 years, uh, and uh, uh, we'll see how we'll see how we, the talk evolves further. Okay, thanks, Cliff. I think that's all from the YouTube channel. Yeah, you too, Melina. Okay, thank you. Uh, this was a good a good question for the end. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for. Um, uh, asking questions. Uh, I have a couple of, uh, I have a slide which I should share for, yeah. I think you should be able to see this, hopefully. No, not yet. You got a surprise for us? It is slide for the next meeting. Uh, oh, a slide for the next meeting. Yes. The next meeting, the next yeah. meeting we come down. <laughs> by a guy named Trefethen that uh, maybe some of you have heard of. So yeah, you should you should see the slides for the, the slide for the talks which are coming up. Uh, thank you again everybody for joining us. Thank you Cleve for giving uh, such a nice talk uh, and uh, see you all next week. Thanks thanks to all of the committee. Thanks to you guys for running this thing. Thanks for Bart uh, for his showrunner uh, from Geneva. Thanks to our hosts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye bye.